Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and today we're going to talk about the second part of the genetic testing series. We will talk about comparative genome hybridization, DNA chips, PCR testing and sequencing of DNA. Let's get started. So comparative genome hybridization is a molecular cytogenetic method and it is used to analyze the whole genome to indicate if there was a loss or a gain of genetic material, but it's not used for translocations or inversions, so when the genetic material stays the same amount, but it's just changed in its arrangement. It is based on competitive in situ hybridization in metaphase chromosomes, and it is used on a solid surface, like for example a DNA chip, in which microscopic DNA spots are aligned in a different pattern and are labeled with different colors. But to that I will explain more in a second. So they are differently created DNA fragments and they can bind to the patient's single-stranded DNA and this can be measured by measuring the levels of large numbers of genes. So it allows to scan for the presence of extra or missing genetic material in one single experiment. But as I said before, it cannot be used for balanced rearrangements. Let's talk more about the DNA chip, which is basically the practical use of this comparative genome hybridization. So here the collection of DNA spots are fixed on a solid surface, in this case the chip, and this is used for the investigation of large numbers of genes simultaneously. So different DNA sequences are labeled with different fluorescent colors, like for example green and red, and the DNA probe, which is taken from the patient, will bind competitively to those. In case of different mutations and different changes in the genome, we will get different colors. So, for example, in the case of a deletion of the reference DNA we are examining, more of this reference DNA will be bound, giving a higher intensity of one color, like for example the red color. In case of gain of genetic material, there will be a higher intensity of the other color, in this case the green color. And if we get a neutral color as a result, this will indicate that there was no gain or loss of genetic material. But that does not mean that there was no change in the genome. We would just need another kind of investigation method to figure that out. This test is used in the detection of chromosomal rearrangements, in pre-implantation genetic testing and also in cancer genetics. It has different advantages and limitations. One advantage is that all 46 chromosomes can be investigated simultaneously and with only using one test. It can also detect smaller deletions or duplications than cytogenic testing, but it cannot detect balanced rearrangements, polyploidy or single gene disorders. The next point I want to talk about is DNA analysis. So just in general, there are three main steps we have to follow. The first is the extraction of the DNA. The second is the amplification of DNA by PCR, a method we will soon talk about and DNA analysis with different kind of tests that can be used. Sources of DNA are anticoagulated whole blood, frozen or fresh tissue samples, chorionic villus biopsies or cultures of amniocytes and also buccal swabs, so of the inner lining of the cheek. Now I want to talk about the second step of DNA analysis, the PCR method. Especially in relation now to corona, I'm sure you have heard of PCR tests. And those are used to replicate short specific DNA sequences. There are three stages. The first one is the denaturation of the double-stranded DNA. This is done with thermal denaturation in 94 degrees. The second step is annealing of the oligonucleotide primers. And the third step is the synthesis of DNA by thermostable DNA polymerase. This is the enzyme that will make the copies. This method has two specific advantages. The first one is that exact copies can be very quickly produced. And this test has a very high sensitivity and very high specificity. So it can be used to very, very quickly generate copies, which then can be used for further investigation. And also 
dried blood or small tissue samples are enough to be used. So for example in a crime scene when there was only found one small drop of dried blood that can be enough to figure out who uh, caused the crime. But however it also has some limitations. It can only be used for a specific mutation so it cannot exclude other mutations. And the nucleotide sequence must be known to synthesize the primer. Now I want to talk about sequencing. This is the process of determining the nucleotide order of a given DNA fragment. Like for example the oligonucleotide primer. And it is used in the detection of point mutations. This is the first investigation method we talk about which is used even for single base mutations. There are different kind of sequencing methods. The first one I want to talk about is the Sanger, I'm not sure if it's Sanger, if it's pronounced that way. Well however, the Sanger sequencing method it's also the gold standard and it is used in the generation of DNA fragments which each are terminated with a labeled nucleotide. So these DNA fragments or DNA sequences are separated by length by the help of a sequencing machine or the capillary gel electrophoresis so that the generated DNA fragments will be sorted from the longest fragment in the top part of the gel and in the bottom part the smallest sequences of the DNA. You can imagine that like a net or like a ball pool which the DNA fragments have to work their way through. So the longest, the most heaviest, the most unwindy ones will stay in the most top part of the gel. And the ones that are more smaller and more flexible and can more easily go through this agar agar gel, they will go further down in the gel. And like that, we can sort them by length. The next method I want to talk about is the next generation sequencing, also called massive, massively parallel sequencing. And it has gotten its name because it's a sequencing method for the whole genome. So it's one technique which is used to sequence all of the protein coding regions. So it is used in patients with intellectual disability of unknown origin, dysmorphic syndrome or familial cancer. An advantage is that it has a short turnaround time, but however it needs a big database to be able to compare the results. And if there is some new variation which the database doesn't know, there will only be an unclear interpretation and it won't be possible to give a diagnosis or a clear answer to the patient based on this test. The next one I want to talk about and the last one is the paternity testing. It's also called mini satellite sequencing or DNA fingerprints and this is a test which is used in criminology and paternity testing and here the test is able to simultaneously detect lots of mini satellites in the genome to produce a pattern which is unique to one individual and um, this is done by finding sequences in the DNA which are kind of rare in combination or which are individual for one person and this is the so-called DNA fingerprint and this depends on the probability of a match. So the probability that two people share identical numbers of repeats in several locations is very very small even between twins. This is why it can be used to for example detect which of even siblings or twins is the guilty one in a case or which of several people might be the father of a child. I hope this video was helpful and if you liked the video I would be very happy if you could subscribe. Thank you very much.